Hi there. I'm Matthew Sheffield. Thanks for joining me today for another live broadcast of Theory of Change. Got another great topic, as always, for you today. Uh, but before we get into the program, I just wanted to take care of a few housekeeping items. So um, the show, uh, for those who are watching the first time or uh, first couple of times, um, the show is part of the Flux Media Network, which is a nonprofit uh, network of podcasters and writers um, producing content about politics, religion, technology, and media, and how they all intersect, um, and uh, with a heavy emphasis on discussing some of the aspects of internet culture and religious uh, fundamentalism that you can't really get anywhere else. So please do check us out. Uh, that's at flux.community. And then if you want to go directly to the Theory of Change archive, uh, just go to theoryofchange.show and you will go right to the episode archive with uh, transcripts and all that stuff. Um, and then if you like what we're doing, please do go to patreon.com slash discoverflux and you can help us out there because we, the corporate media out there, they don't care about about the larger trends in politics because it's hard for them to understand anything that consists of anything beyond, well, so-and-so said this, and I walked over here and so-and-so said that. Um, but the re reality is that the day-to-day -day events that we see are actually, they flow from larger trends. And um, that's why we're, we're here and, and trying to bring you the bigger picture. All right. So with that out of the way, let's get into today's program. We certainly have our problems. But humans have come a long way since we emerged as a distinct species roughly 300,000 years ago. Most recently, the key to our progress has been the idea that you gain more knowledge by questioning what you know to begin with. Socrates' idea of question everything was a great one, and it led to a lot more great ideas, chief among them the scientific method of developing hypotheses and then testing them. To see if they are yes to see if they're real and it's worked out great for us so far but in the last few years the development of readily accessible mass publishing has made it so that the tools of gaining knowledge can be turned against knowledge itself for a lot of people questioning everything has been reimagined into questioning everyone except yourself i call it the zombie socratic method but as finite beings, it's always been easy for humans to delude ourselves. But now, social media has made it so that millions of people can get rich, helping us destroy knowledge rather than gain it. Joining me today to discuss this subject is Matthew Brown. He's a professor at Central Queensland University in Australia, where he does research on gambling, addiction, and delusional reasoning. Those interests have also led him to be the co-host of Decoding the Gurus, a podcast that closely examines the techniques of a variety of individuals who have built up massive followings, selling everything from alternative medicines to political conspiracies. Thanks for being here, Matt. Yes, nice to be here, Matthew. All right. Well, so uh, this is, uh, you, you get two podcasters together talking the they'll probably talk forever. So I, I do want to uh, structure our discussion here a little bit here. But so but before we get into it, um, tell us for those who haven't listened to Decoding the Gurus, what 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 is it? And how long have you been doing? It? Yes, well, like most middle aged white men in the world, we I have a podcast. And <laughs> um, we I have one because um, oh, about 18 months ago, I um, connected with um, another academic, a fellow called Chris Kavanagh, who's an anthropologist um, uh, who holds positions at Oxford and is based in Japan now. And uh, we were both two online and still are. And as a result, had noticed uh, a lot of interesting characters um those the sorts of people you're talking about the um uh, these people that present themselves as public intellectuals um but seem to do a lot of tricky maneuvers um with seemingly with the goal of capturing more of your attention and building up their sense of credibility and authoritativeness uh, often with little substance to back that up so um our initial intent was to write a bit 
um, academically about this, um, linking what we were seeing to stuff in the literature that we already knew about. So how cults work and how conspiracies work. And um, there's a concept called pseudo profound bullshit in the literature, which um, is quite useful as well. Um, but uh, we didn't really have our thoughts in order. So um, we thought we would, um, you know, study a few more people and, uh, you know, re record ourselves as we talked about them. About them. And uh, yeah, ended up making this podcast, Decoding the Gurus. Uh, you guys have have recorded how many episodes now, or released how many by now? Oh dear, I have totally lost track. We we do a lot of interviews as well with some mm -hmm. with some interesting people with some uh, insight to share. So, but I think all in all, maybe fifty or, or sixty. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Well, I can definitely encourage people to check it out. You guys. Uh, one of the uh, things that is, I think, perhaps a bit different um, about the approach that you're taking um, is that you try to, uh, instead of try to uh, make broad uh, comments on the history of particular individuals, that you guys are looking at uh, specific pieces of content um, and try to focus on in detail on the techniques that are used and the um, the, the ver specific verbiage that, that people use um, right yeah yeah that's that's correct um, I think what we would hope to do is um, give people um, perhaps some some tools um, show them some red flags and help them become um, better consumers of information. Uh, so we find it helpful to just take a, a limited piece of content because it takes longer, as is famously said, to debunk bullshit than to spout bullshit, right? So um, casting the net too wide wouldn't work very well. So we take uh, a limited amount of content, usually just one or two uh, episodes or a document of some kind, and we listen to it carefully and we talk about it carefully. We try to be as charitable as possible and because our intention is not to, uh, I guess, foreground our own opinions and go, oh, you know, so-and-so Douglas Murray is is wrong about this because because he's that's, that's too right-wing and we think, you know, this is better. We try to focus on stuff that is like demonstrably false and misleading and um, uh, like rhetorical ploys. So our, our bar is actually pretty low. To, to get a clean bill of health <laughs> for, in our evaluation, you don't have to uh, align with us politically. You don't have to, to be the best, most profound thinker in the world. You just need to not do these devious um, propaganda-oriented um, rhetorical tricks. Um, so we cover a bunch of people. Some of them are very good. Um, some of them are kind of fine, you know, not too bad, and and some of them are not good. So um, yeah, so I, I, you know, hopefully the whole process of of going through it um, is um, helps people identify those themes and red flags. And we've done that in terms of organizing the stuff that we think are red flags into this um, thing we call, in a tongue in cheek way, the garometer, which which is really just a list of themes. Um, there is, let's see, 10 of them. I won't read them all out, but just to give you a sense of it, I might just tell you about the first three. Um, so like the, the first one is, we call it galaxy brainness. And this oh, I, 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 and I'm actually, sorry. Um, would you mind doing the retweet of the show there? I uh, forgot to oh, yes. remind you about that. Um, oh, sure, 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 sure. Um, yeah. Okay, there just so we can make sure you're... Your yeah. Twitter followers are, will be joining in if they're interested. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so so yeah, you were saying though the the gurometer of what's what's the first one? Yeah, so uh, this this galaxy brainness. So we live in this world where you know exp it's it's famously being flattened, right? Expertise is being flattened, and uh, when you some some people are presenting themselves as having kind of this this general purpose. Um, 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 you know, understanding of every topic that comes across their radar. So when we see someone who is linking together like these disparate concepts, so Deepak Chopra is a perfect example, right? He'll link together quantum mechanics and consciousness. Um, uh, Brett and Heather Weinstein, they 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 take 
um, their, their field, which is evolutionary biology, and they use it to explain history, culture, politics, everything. They call it looking at the world through an evolutionary lens. So um, there's also a degree of cultishness, which is our second um, um, thing there. Like when, when you see that an online character is cultivating this very strong in-group of people who can really understand what's going on and is maybe above the sort of political fray or is, and th they'll often flatter their followers um, um, often tell them what what's what clever and discerning people they are. But on the other hand, they generally, like a cult leader, do not brook criticism. So if if um, if they start to experience that, then the followers will find themselves ejected from the inner circle pretty quickly. And the last thing I'll tell you about, because I've got ten and I don't want to bore you by <laughs> listing them all. Um, is important actually because it's linked to conspiracism, and we've called it again, tongue in cheekly, anti-establishmentarianism. Because this is something you almost always see with the more toxic uh, online opinionators, which is that the official narrative, um, the institutions have screwed up royally, right? They're, they're lying to you. They cannot be trusted. And really, you need to go to them and, and people like them in order to have an accurate view of the world. So this parallels, I suppose, a broader trend in um in politics especially american political politics i suppose where um the the right wing sort of used to be it used to be conservative i suppose but in many and like the defender of the status quo in the establishment um but it's um shifted in an interesting way to actually being um against the establishment and really kind of wanting to burn it all down so mm -hmm. but 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 with gurus you can see that this is an extremely attractive kind um uh position to take we, we would all like to get like we, we all feel dissatisfied with the establishment the status quo we, we all feel frustrated with mainstream media um we can all see the problems with um, various institutions scientific academic political whatever um so the the niche i suppose that the online gurus fill is to provide this alternative. Um, but unfortunately, in our opinion, in almost every case, the, alter the, the alternative is worse than, than the status quo. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing also, though, about this, um, this attitude that they're encouraging in people is that not only do they want you to you know, think everybody else is wrong uh, and you can't trust what they say, you also can't trust what other people say about them. Um, so in other words, if, if a person, you know, has objectively demonstrated that so-and-so, you know, did a certain thing or said a certain thing, well, you can't trust them because they're part of the establishment. Um, yeah. and, um, yeah. and, and, and these are, these are techniques and ideas that, that do come from, uh, cult, uh, organizations, mm -hmm. religious cult organizations. Can you talk about yeah. that? Is that, was that how you kind of originally got interested in this as a media phenomenon? Yeah, exactly right. I mean, we call them secular gurus and we call them gurus because we want to make that parallel to, um, you know, religious or, you know, spiritual um, groups or thinkers. And you're right, they do use some of the same techniques. There are some interesting differences as well. Um, but um, that technique of making all criticism illegitimate, essentially, um, is is quite a clever one um in the same way that a, a scientologist or a um i'm, tr I'm blanking on the name of another cult <laughs> but, well but, i can tell you based on my own experience that so yeah. I, I i was born and raised as a fundamentalist mormon mm. um and in mormonism the the church leaders explicitly tell people do not read non-church members who criticize us because they're anti-mormons you cannot trust anti-mormons in fact mm. it's it's it is morally wrong to even read what they have to say um, you are sinning just by reading it it's a sin yeah exactly so eric weinstein one of our um gurus that we've covered and, and, and i'm sorry who is eric weinstein for those okay. who don't know who that is because he because again because of internet segmentation 
a lot of people they can have massive audiences and a lot of people have no idea other people have no idea who they are who is there i'm really Weinstein? glad I'm really glad to hear that a typical person doesn't know who Eric Weinstein is. That's music that <laughs> to my ears. Um, but Eric Weinstein coined the term intellectual dark web. Um, I, I don't know if people would be familiar with that, but it was a bit of a, a thing um, for the last few years since about 2018. Um, so a bunch of figures that we've covered um, have fallen, uh, are included in that category label. So people like Jordan Peterson, uh, Douglas Murray, um, who else? Um, uh, Joe Rogan, um, that kind of ben, thing. Ben Shapiro was in the list oh, yeah, as well. That's, that's right. So it was um, Eric who, who who coined that term, um, perhaps to kind of attach himself to a group of people that were a little bit more, um, you know, well known than he was. Um, being slightly cynical about it, um, but you know they. Or that group kind of exemplifies a much broader trend that we see in the internet, that, which is the topic of our discussion today, which is these um, characters who are purportedly um, have a commitment to civil dialogue and civil conversations, even when they disagree ferociously. Um, they typically have this resistance uh, um, to sort of mainstream political correctness, that kind of thing. And they think of themselves as kind of banished or excluded or on the outside of institutions like universities and such. So even, even though they Eric, have larger audiences than almost any university professor who exists. That, that's, that's <laughs> right. And, and even though some people like Jordan Peterson did, did, did hold a tenured um, university job for a long time before eventually... Um, uh, dropping it completely in favor of sort of popular appeal. So it was Eric Weinstein who uh, termed that, um, and uh, and he is himself, in our opinion, very much a secular guru. He has claimed to have invented a, um, a, 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 a great leap forward in physics. His background is in theoretical physics. Um, not that he's really published anything on it, uh, in the academic literature, but he has written an informal manuscript uh, on his theory of called geometric unity. And um, according to Eric, um, he um, he delayed that publication for some time because he thought the kind of that kind of powerful knowledge would be the human race wasn't quite ready for it. This is the kind of thing that could maybe permit faster than light travel. Um, the, the, it's been obviously ignored by. So he so he gave it to Peter Thiel instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. But you know, this is an aspect. I mean, Eric is a great example. Again, exemplifies something we see a lot of them, which is that they they're pretty much fully concerned with weaving a narrative and a mythos around themselves, um, being this visionary thinker, being someone who has seen further, um, is not standing on the shoulders of giants, stands alone. And, uh, you know, that's, again, it has these parallels with the um, um, religious gurus that we talked about. And they do um, use those same techniques. So Eric Weinstein um, likes to coin acronyms and neologisms. Um, and he has a couple like the distributed idea suppression complex, the DISC, and the GIN, G-I-N, the gated institutional narrative. So you can just tell from those phrases that it, it's very similar to what you were describing with the Mormons, which is these are sort of constructs or theoretical ideas that he's invented, which the the purpose of which is to um, basically explain, it, it, they, it accomplishes several things, actually, it's quite interesting. One, this idea that the establishment, the institutions are all against them and is this corrupt kind of self-protective um, you know, monopoly uh, on on intellectual thought. It explains why the outsiders, the the gurus, are not better recognised. It explains why most people um, and and most most institutions or um, do not recognise their genius. So it's helpful in that respect. But um, as you said, it's also very helpful for um, delegitimizing any criticism. So, for instance, if 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 the physicists are not paying attention to his grand um, unified theory, um, geometric unity, well, that's because of the gated institutional narrative where they're too afraid of these dangerous ideas and they're totally corrupt. So, yeah, it does it does parallel religious cults in those respects. 
Um, yeah, it does. And the, the other the other interesting thing that um, and we talked about this before the our show here today that um, you guys were not originally you and Chris were not originally intending to have it be so politically oriented. Um, but it became that way just by virtue of the like it, it became that way based on, on who the audience was. Mm. Or is it because of who the subjects are? It's because what of who think? the subjects are, I would say. Okay. So so I guess here's, here's the thing to be aware of. I mean, we we live in an, I mean, we like to say we live in an information economy, but to a large degree, we live in an attention economy with every everybody, right? You, me, the New York Times and the gurus, <laughs> anyone who is making any kind of public commentary of any kind um, is competing for attention. And one way of describing the gurus is that they are characters who are willing to stoop lower, I suppose, in order to capture that attention. And the fact is, is the politics, making people upset, making people angry, making them afraid um, is the best way to capture someone's attention. So it's, it's hardly surprising that uh, most of our toxic gurus do have a strong political bent to them. They're, they 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 will sometimes be a straightforward left or right wing agitator activist. Um, you, we, we talked about Dinesh D'Souza beforehand, and he would certainly fall into that category. Um, but many of them take a, a slightly stranger or more abstract political um, perspective that is sometimes hard to discern. But they certainly do the same things, which is to um, essentially be present themselves as Cassandras, like warning of this impending doom. The vaccines are yeah. are, are going to kill us all. Um, you know, Muslims the, are going to kill us all. Yeah, <laughs> terrible, terrible <laughs> things are going down. And unless you pay attention to them right now and get this information, you'll be led like lambs to the slaughter into this catastrophe. So, you know, that sells, right? That sells a lot better than, you know, some, some dispassionate, talk about some abstract intellectual topic so it's um as a result most of the gurus do have a strong political slant therefore it's hard for us to totally escape the pull of of politics and we we have to acknowledge we have our own political um opinions um and you know view of the world um we don't want the show and I'm just not interested in being a political activist of any kind, um, and Chris isn't either. Um, we are interested in the critical consumption of information and hopefully um, helping people develop better information literacy. And we'd like to think that you can do that regardless of where you land on the political spectrum, whatever your convictions are. Um, but when somebody is, um, I don't know, talking about the capital riot or something and making it out to be a false flag or something, it, it you know you you have to um I, I guess one's own worldview comes into play when you're uh, making some assumptions about whether or not these claims are true or false yeah well and and that kind of goes to the, the to the topic that i was talking about in the introduction the idea of what i'm calling the zombie socratic method so in the socratic method of of socrates uh, obviously um the idea is that the reason that we engage in Socratic dialogue is to question and to separate what we know from what we assume, uh, because a lot of things that we think are facts are actually just assumptions. Um, and so that's the point of, of, of Socratic in inquiry. But basically what you guys are calling gurus, um, or we'll, we could just call them sort of misinformation purveyors, um, what they're doing is they're changing the Socratic method to say that, well, everything is an opinion. Um, it, nothing is knowable. Uh, and you should question everything that everyone says to you, except for me. Uh, you should take what I say as the truth because I'm against the establishment. I'm the only one that tells you the truth. Um, and, and, and what I found when I have personally, and you can maybe tell me how it is in the discussions you've had with people, but when, when I engage with people who are Joe Rogan fans or anti-vax people, uh, obviously a big overlap there, um, that they don't they don't believe in objective reality, which is interesting 
uh, because they often claim that they do. And then like in like in the case of Rogan or uh, Eric Weinstein and his brother, Brett Weinstein, you know, they both claim that they're not political, uh, even though Eric Weinstein literally works for a right wing libertarian, you know, who some people are calling a fascist, uh, mm -hmm. Peter Thiel. Um, like, obviously, they have political opinions and Joe Rogan does not invite socialists onto his program on the regular. Uh, these are, you know, these are highly politicized individuals. Jordan Peterson obviously is not going out there talking about how God does not exist. Uh, and it's a myth and the Bible is full of nonsense, even though he himself says he doesn't believe in the Bible and is not religious. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's an interesting dynamic that's afoot there, I would say. Yeah, I mean... The thing, the thing that unites those things is that the, what the person is doing, what it, is not what it says on the tin, right? And um, people listening who are who might be listening who are fans of these people will say, no, 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 that's that's completely wrong, Matthew. You know, Joe Rogan repeatedly says, I'm just a big dummy. People shouldn't listen to me, right? Um, uh, people like Eric or Brett Weinstein um, make a big deal about about um, intellectual humility and having these honest discussions and being willing to revise their opinions when new evidence comes along. Um, the, the people that are prominent anti-vaxxers will, will claim that they are interested in science and that they are simply following the evidence. So, and, uh, unfortunately, you know, so <laughs> any good thing that comes along tends to get imitated and you end up with this asats version of it and so i quite like your concept of um, the zombie socratic dialogue because there is this intense element of cosplay <laughs> to to what they are doing it's all about acting a part and when you focus on acting the part you can be very very good at it so um, our, our most recent, um, or we are shortly will be releasing an episode of uh, Brett Weinstein and a, a less known, well, a less well known character called Al Alexandros Marinos, who is essentially just a super fan. And you will see them um, um, acting out the uh, process of a, sci of a critical scientific evaluation of a randomized control trial to evaluate ivermectin, this proposed treatment for COVID. Um, to evaluate this trial. So um, they've both been massive proponents of ivermectin at the same time talking a great deal about the risks of vaccinations and how vaccinations don't work. Um, so they've really invested a huge amount of you know, capital, um, reputational capital in ivermectin um, and they're doubling and tripling down on it. Um, neither of them um, have any expertise in RCTs. Uh, neither of them um, have any experience in real research really. Um, yet, but you will see if you listen to that episode, this, this elaborate charade of, of dispassionately evaluating the, the methods of a, you know, a pretty standard randomized control trial, which, which ended up with results showing that ivermectin didn't work. And of course, finding thousands of, <laughs> thousands of problems with it. Um, but along the way, you can find you can find out things like that um, Alexandros Marinos doesn't understand how to interpret a p-value, right? A p-value is just a, a frequentist um, um, method of determining whether uh, a result is statistically significant. You'll find out on the way that um, Brett Weinstein doesn't understand what power is in in the context of an RCT. He talks about he talks about the study being underpowered and demonstrates again and again that he thinks that means that they didn't give the p patients enough ivermectin when in actual fact anyone who has even a passing like even my undergraduate students if you ask them would know that an underpowered study is one where you do not have enough subjects right not enough data that's what underpowered means so these are just a couple of examples to illustrate that they genuinely do not know what they're talking about but the interesting thing is is that they're very good at appearing to know <laughs> what they're talking about. Um, Brett sounds extraordinarily professorial. He has this lovely baritone authoritative voice. They, they do a lot of the TED talk uh, type maneuvers of like, okay, now let me just lay this out for you. For, for those people that don't understand, you know, this kind of um, very authoritative tone. And unless you actually have 
familiar, which most people do not obviously have a great deal of familiarity with, with, with running randomized control trials, then this will be extremely convincing to you. And you will come away from it with the very strong impression that these are two extremely intelligent, very trustworthy people who have looked into this trial and yet again, um, showing that ivermectin works just great. Um, and then they'll read in the mainstream media or from some some scientist type person from some university that ivermectin doesn't work, which is actually which is the actual truth, and that will start to lead them down this conspiratorial rabbit hole, where you reallocate your trust from these institutions who are usually anonymous, aren't talking to you directly, you don't feel like you have a personal relationship with them, to characters like this, these secular gurus who are who are who you feel are trustworthy so so a good you know so the, i think that there's two aspects to having good information literacy and navigating the minefield that is the internet infosphere um one of them is just sort of critical thinking and paying attention to the content doing you know you can do fact checking that kind of thing for instance when when somebody claims that oh they've been using ivermectin in japan for for the last couple of years and it's been amazing and that's why japan has got low COVID deaths well you can google that and you can fact check that and find out that that is entirely untrue um so that so you can look for the red flags that we spell out in our gorometer but the other thing you can do is really focus on cultivating a good trust network you know you it, a lot of it boils down on who you should be trusting and who you shouldn't be trusting um and allocating your trust correctly will will save you a whole bunch of of pain basically mm -hmm. well and i guess one of the other you know because the the people who who engage in these practices that you guys focus on have you know be, become a lot more inherently political um one of the other things that i guess and and we discussed this also beforehand was this you know you, you were not intending it to not only what did you not want it to be a political show, you also were not trying to focus necessarily on one side of the political spectrum more than the other. But as it turns out, it seems like there are uh, almost all the most successful gurus are on the right. Um, and, and many of the people who are aspiring gurus who say they're on the left, well, all they ever do is criticize Democrats and talk about how much they hate uh, Joe Biden um, mm, and yeah. never say anything about Donald Trump or anybody else on the right. I mean, yeah. what's it's like there's a there's something in the water on the on, on the political right. But a lot of people who have maybe more moderate conservative tendencies, they don't it makes them upset when if you yeah. point that out to them, I, I, I found. <laughs> Mm, yeah. Now, look, that's that's all true. I think um, certainly there are a lot of pseudo liberals. <laughs> I don't know why. I do not know why um, some people who are right leaning feel like they need to pretend to be left leaning. Um, why not just be be who you are and present yourself in a straightforward way? Um, as to your other point, um, I agree with you. This is something which Chris and I have talked about uh, a lot, which is that. Um, we we don't want it to be a, a politically violenced podcast. Um, we would like to pull out examples from across the political spectrum to help people identify issues. Like, because of course, the most um, appealing and seductive ideas that are wrong will will come from a place that deeply appeals to your to your what about, political and moral convictions and intuitions so we would like to source um deceptive material from across the political spectrum and we are actually intending to do a season where we're going to be covering sort of bitcoin and tech bro um sense making types which is going to be fun next but then after that we will be um focusing on um left-wing gurus um and you know, I use gurus again in the in a pretty broad sense. We cover a lot of people that don't conform to this sort of stereotype or this archetypal, you know, internet guru that we've just been discussing. We'll we'll essentially look at almost any content and and look for look for logical uh, or rhetorical problems with it. But uh, as you say, the the archetypal guru is does seem to be more of a feature 
on the the center right, say, um, and going further out to the right. Um, the intellectual dark web that we talked about, for instance, was very much, even though they claimed to be, many of them claimed to be liberals, um, it was really center right leaning with a sort of libertarian, uh, you know, um, yeah, uh, slightly like anti woke, I, I guess, bent. So why is that? I mean, we're not really sure, but I, I do think there is something about the culture, um, the, the the sociology of left and right wing contemporary politics. Um, as we just talked about, right wing politics in the states and to some degree elsewhere is becoming increasingly less conservative and more populist and more conspiratorial and more geared around the kind of cult of personality of the strong leader. So we obviously saw that with Donald Trump, and you also see it with this otherwise mystifying positive regard for someone like Vladimir Putin, um, who exemplified that that kind of cult of personality. So I think I think the sociology of it is that on the right hand side of politics, there is a greater tendency to um, you know find someone who is a great person to follow and to basically be quite a loyal follower. Of that person, so someone like Jordan Peterson inspires a massive degree of um, loyalty amongst his fans. And if you try to find a, a writer or a sense maker on the left, perhaps some feminist writer, maybe Kate Mann, something like that, um, you will struggle to find that degree of loyalty. You know, you might find people reading that book and uh, or um, saying good things about it, or whatever. But you'll also find a lot of people criticizing it. There's a lot of backbiting. Um, mm -hmm. a, there just seems to be a, less of a tendency to sort of sort of follow the leader tendency on the left, um, to be both sides about it and to 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 give um, to try to be fair. I mean, you know, it's not like this is the only toxic um, sociological phenomena on the left side of politics um, relative to the right. Then, you know, arguably one sees more of this, uh, I guess, kind of conformity. And or, or the mobbing or cancelling that kind of thing, where if if one does not conform to the sort of group's uh, consensus uh, point of view, then one can um, find oneself ejected. So um, yeah, so but yeah, I think there's a political balance to it, and there's a reason why most of our gurus tend to be on the right. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, I think the other thing also is. Um... To go to your uh, to your guru um, your to the point of the anti-establishmentarianism, the you know if uh, so in the United States um, when so the Republican Party was originally kind of a multi-ideological party. There were moderate Republicans, liberal Republicans in the 1950s, and uh, basically the kind of reactionary types went out, took over the party in 1964 with Barry Goldwater. Uh, and then they proceeded to cancel any Republican who disagreed with them. Um, and so it's like that's actually where cancel culture started was in the 1960s by that the Barry Goldwater campaign. Um, and but anyway, so the thing about it, though, is that um, when that began, it, it came out of that movement kind of grew out largely um, through through the John Birch Society and also this guy named William F. Buckley, both of whom had very strong anti-academic um, ideologies and, you know, very, um, you know, pro-God, pro-gun uh, type religious fundamentalism. Uh, that was their audience. And in fact, uh, Buckley wrote his, his very first book was called God and Man at Yale. Uh, and it was, and it was quite literally. You can you can buy this book uh, at any thrift store or a lot of thrift stores in the United States. Um, that the point of the book was him tattletaling on various professors. Well, so and so doesn't believe in the resurrection. So and so said this about Mary. So and so mm -hmm. said this. Uh, they need to be fired, but they weren't fired. And this university calls itself a, a Christian university. Well, if that's the case, then you need to get rid of this atheist uh, mm -hmm. professor who's mean. Um, and that's the point of the book uh, is basically, look, alumni, you need to take away the money of these evil left wing communist atheists. And uh, and so but effectively what that did, though, is that it made the U.S. 
you know, uh, Republican Party become openly antagonistic toward academia. Uh, and this was because this was in response to a the development of biblical higher criticism like that when that came along as the academic discipline when higher criticism in in biblical studies referring to you know looking at the text not as a historical uh thing but as a thing that as a as a you know looking at it as a as a compiled document um so like understanding the difference between that there's multiple god figures named god has multiple names in the bible uh predominantly um yahweh and el um and anyway so as that hypothesis took it i mean it it became very obvious that that was the case that these were two religions that kind of were smushed together and turned into one um that it became very up upsetting to a lot of people. And that kind of gave birth to a lot of this anti-intellectualism that we see today, mm. um, I would say. Uh, but anyway, but that's a long way of saying that because the the right doesn't like academia, it basically means it's left them to their own devices intellectually, if you will. Um, they have no one forcing mm. them to prove their ideas in a f- sound fashion. Yeah, yeah, it, it it is interesting how the academy, you know, it's you know, it's been it's been it's been liberal leaning and left leaning since forever, and there is something about, um, at least traditional conservative values, which is something, is sort of anti- antithetical to to what the academy is all about, which is sort of genuinely asking questions and genuinely challenging, you know, fond. Uh, assumptions and um, mm-hmm. traditional beliefs um, and I think um, yeah um, <laughs> fundamentalist Christianity in the United States is probably would probably be <laughs> the best example of that yeah and yeah, yeah I mean it, but, uh, but I, I mean much, inherently I'm, I'm though, much in, uh, mm, sorry oh no I was going to say but in, inherently conservatism is not necessarily religious I mean it's no. a, the posture emotionally is skepticism so, um, yeah, which, yep. but it was so a natural conservative is, but like the Ur conservative is like David Hume, who was an atheist. Um, and, uh, but his, his form of conservatism has just been thrown in the garbage can, uh, by the right for the most part, yeah. it seems like. Yeah. I think that's really important to remember that there isn't anything <laughs> inevitable or intrinsic to, to the kind of phenomenon that one sees today or in recent history like it, it didn't have to be that way and it doesn't have to be that way like a conservative party could be a party that wants to conserve the environment right because they're just naturally cautious and don't want to fool around with strange new technologies with unknown effects because we've only got one biosphere so we need to look after it right like that makes perfect logical sense right it's kind mm-hmm. of an, a, an accident of political history I mean, not an accident. There's good reasons for it, obviously. But um, I guess I'm just just backing up your point, which is that there's nothing inherently toxic. There's nothing inherently conspiratorial. There's nothing inherently anti-institutional about conservative conservatism in the broader sense. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a shame where where the the direction that the contemporary right has been going. Um, you know, I, I keep saying in the United States, um, but you know, it, you, you can see, you can see, you can see features of this happening all across Europe and to some degree um, in places like Australia or Canada or New Zealand. Yeah, well, in that regard, though, I mean, isn't it? It is kind of always fascinating to me how non, how much non-Americans know and care about American politics. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I, you know, like I, I've had not other non-Americans on my show before. And I, I said, oh, well, let's talk about your country's politics. And they say, oh, no, 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 thank you. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, here's the, the sad fact is that your politics is simply more interesting than ours. <laughs> There's so much drama. We we don't have the the, the same kind of crazy stuff going down there's, there's there's no capital rides happening in australia um our politicians are basically a bunch of dummies in stuffed shirts but um blathering about nothing but we, we don't have the colorful characters 
Um, so yeah, polit American politics is different. It's more interesting. Um, it, it also in the online interconnected world, like there, like there is an Austra there is obviously domestic Australian politics, and people only talk about domestic Australian politics. But you'll never meet those people <laughs> because they're not they're not they're not talking about the same things as that as an American would be talking about. If you want to participate in um, with the large majority of the social media then you have to talk about American politics because you know about American politics, but Americans don't know about whatever country you're from, New Zealand politics, mm -hmm. right? Or very, very little. So if you want to participate in the discourse and we are, are all mere servants of the discourse, as Chris Kavanaugh likes to say, then you kind of um, need to engage. Um, as well as that, um, you know, phenomena that tend to happen in America, you know, you, you tend to see them here as well. Um, they might be less um, extreme um, or it could be happening in a few years' time as opposed to today. But um, America does export, especially to the Anglosphere, an awful lot of culture. So... Um, oh, so, yeah, so well, you might be able to get your capital riots after all then. <laughs> it could happen. It could happen. We've, we've certainly had a lot of jokers turn up at Parliament House down in Canberra, a bunch of idiots. So, you know, um, they're, they're giving it a go. I mean, we have our own corpulent um, right wing demagogue um, grifter um, in, in Australia as well, who's like a low budget uh, Donald Trump. Um, I won't even mention his name, but yeah. Uh, um, Okay, Clive Palmer in the United Australian Party. Yeah, so we, we, we have like a like a toned down, slightly stupider, slightly less interesting version of whatever you have. <laughs> yeah, well, um, it's, I mean, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're interesting in all the wrong ways. Um, <laughs> but so just to uh, go back, though, you, you were saying, uh, you know, that a lot of these right-wing gurus don't want to say that they're right-wing. Um, and it reminded me of something of a, of a New York Times profile that came out in the 1990s. Uh, I'm going to put it up on the screen. So this was a, a profile piece that was that was written in... Uh, I, actually, I can't read the word here in me. <laughs> it's on my other screen here. 1995. Uh, and basically, the thesis of this profile... Uh, is that there's a new generation of conservatives and they're not like the other ones that you have known. These are not your, uh, they're young, they're bold, they're ambitious, and they have sex. That, that literally is one of the themes in the profile. Um, <laughs> they have sex. And, yeah, and good but here, and what? Yeah, good for them. I, I, who who knew that people had sex? Like, I, I, I this is a new thing. Uh, but what's funny though about the picture further though is that so you, on the front there, that's actually Laura Ingram, the Fox News host, uh, when she was in her uh, early thirties or late twenties. I for, I forget. But uh, then I'm gonna flip that. So she's got a, a leopard print uh, skirt there. But look at this, right there, leopard print jacket. This is from the more recent New York Times uh, intellectual dark web picture. So you have um, one of the people who was mentioned in there. Uh, what's her name? Uh, the uh, Christina Hoff Summers. She's got the, the le leopard print. So I, I, it's just this kind of interesting parallel, visual parallel between the way that the mainstream press um, is doing these, uh, you know, allowing for these sort of rebrands of, of, of conservative uh, punditry that it, even, but they're doing it in the exact same way. These are not, these are not your father's conservatives. These are different people. They've got different ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. But then when you go back and look at the ideas, it's literally the same ideas. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe welfare is not a, a good use of money because some people are just stupider or maybe, you know, women should not have rights because, well, women should have babies. Uh, you know, like that's the exact same type of arguments that you're hearing from today's intellectual dark web, which mm. suggests that there's really nothing new under the sun, including leopard print clothing <laughs> <laughs> well i mean actually i was just looking into christina hoff summers because i didn't i didn't know much about her because we're, we're writing an article um, to celebrate the four-year anniversary of the intellectual dark web and as, as you mentioned she's one of the, the founding members and those photos were from the the photo shoot that was imagined there i actually thought some of those mossy bits of logs behind 
Brett Weinstein there looked a bit like penises, but that could just be me. Maybe it's branding, maybe not. <laughs> um, so um, the um, so she's. I mean, you know, I, I don't think that they're all the same. Like I, I think uh, you know, Christian Hoff Summers seems like a sort of libertarian, center rightish. Um, but but still a feminist, you know, uh, who is kind of that old guard feminism that pr- isn't on board with the sort of new wave, right? You know, d- disagree, agree, whatever. I think you know that's that seems to be where she's she's coming from. So, you know, I don't think I don't think they're all the same. I don't think she's identical to Laura Ingraham when she's not identical to Brett Weinstein. They all have their particular takes, and they really do vary in the degree to which they are they are doing um, deceptive rhetorical nonsense. So, you know, I can imagine, I can imagine certain, you know, what w- right-wing figures just being completely upfront about it. You know, it's, uh, you know, um, pr- pr- presenting their point of view, saying that, you know, marriage is between a man and a woman and the, the you know, women should, uh, you know, put, put their family first over a career and a list off every other kind of view um, and do it in a totally non you know transparent and non-deceptive way so brett weinstein who would be much probably closer to where where i would be sitting politically would be far more deceptive than than that kind of that kind of figure on on the you know, the full-throated right um mm-hmm. um yeah so it's i, I just want to emphasize that there's sort of sorry there's actually two different things you know there's there's whether you agree with someone or not is, mm-hmm. is one thing and and whether or not they are putting their position forward in an honest fashion i think decoupling those things is important oh yeah yeah well i, I wasn't meaning to say that they're exactly the same only that these are similar rebranding type um initiatives and mm. uh but this, this is something that happens just periodically uh because i mean you know the nature of both left and right is that the left is going to change its positions over time like that's baked into the cake of saying that you're progressive meaning you believe and change new ideas um whereas you know on the conservative side it's resistance to new ideas and so therefore a person who you know might at some point in their previous you know age uh have decided that their their things that they believed might have put them on the left side of the spectrum well then they decide they don't believe those things so in the same way that or sorry that they don't want to affiliate with the left um like this is just part of the natural order of things um that's the way it's always been i mean if you were uh on the political left at some point that it was okay to say you were in favor of segregation uh, racial mm-hmm. segregation um and so but then at some point the progressives decided well you know what we, we don't like racial segregation we're against that um then you had people saying well okay you know what the the I, i'm against the left now you have abandoned the position uh that i believed um and so that th- there's this kind of sort of inbuilt dynamic that doesn't that i think isn't remarked on enough in when people talk about these larger analyses yeah i mean there's certainly an arc of history there isn't there where things that there has been a general twen- trend towards more liberal more progressive societies in the west um that's been happening for decades now there was, there was a very interesting um tweet that i, I saw that was somebody had taken photos of a, a board game that was popular in the 1980s um called like it, was it called dilemma no um anyway it, the the game involved like posing these dilemmas that you would kind of you know talk about in a fun way about whether or not you know you would do this or not and to to our eyes today in 2022 it's kind of shocking right because this 1980s board game is posing dilemmas like you know you find out that your 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 neighbors have been abusing their children you've tried talking to them about it but they but they refuse to should you tell the authorities <laughs> that's meant to be a dilemma um or your 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 daughter wants to date a black man or something um you know do do, do you advise her not to to to, to date boys of, of her own race again that was posed as a dilemma in like a family board game just in the 1980s so so that certainly supports your point right that there is this there is this you know we, we almost don't observe it like i was a, i was a kid uh, you know a young child in the 1980s so i don't really remember 
that period um, firsthand. But you know, for for those of us who are, are of a certain age, you you do actually kind of forget what uh, you know, and you're like a frog in a in a in a pond that's changing temperature, and you're not really aware of it. Um, so yeah, we can kind of forget. Um, yeah, well, and it, it makes it also that so if you're, you know, somebody who opposes racial segregation, well, that doesn't mean that you're a progressive because the conservatives eventually adopted that belief. Well, most of them. Uh, <laughs> um, and so that's not a so when somebody is saying, well, th this mean this is proof I'm a I'm a liberal. I'm against racial segregation. Well, that's not proof yeah. you're a liberal at all. Uh, if that's no, what the you're, consensus. you're you're a you're a nineteen eighties liberal. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, yeah, it, but the the other thing though about it though is that um, I think and 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 this might also be sort of a I, I do want to talk about the idea of why there has been kind of a a migration of sort of this. You know, I'm a liberal, but I hate. The Democrats, or the you know, and you, this has been a kind of a new genre of media uh, uh, punditry that you've now got this whole class of people like Tulsi Gabbard, like Glenn Greenwald, like Matt Taibbi. Uh, I mean, there's a bunch of these, or Tim Pool even, and he's mm -hmm. he's finally come clean. Uh, Dave Rubin was was Dave this Rubin. way as well for a long yeah. time, um, and so th that they're they obviously they do not say liberal things they do not criticize the republicans they don't criticize trump they don't advocate for let's say you know single payer health care they don't do any of those things um but they want you to call them liberal um mm. and their audience is exclusively right wing mm. um yeah. and so the question I is no but i was going to say but I, I i i think it's more similar to if you are trained as a french chef but you only make sushi. Well, you're a sushi chef. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no. So I, the question you're posing is why, why, why the charade? Yeah, why, why be why? What is the appeal of wanting to present yourself as something that you're not? And I think there's a connection there to um, part of the appeal of our gurus and their audiences, like their audience. I mean, the people that come to them are actually generally kind of curious. They may well be disenchanted with various things, but these are people that want to be intellectually stimulated. They want to feel that they're getting a deeper understanding of the world and they want to feel like their intelligence is being respected. You know, they're not just being given, you know, 10 second sound bites or just being told some slogan that they're supposed to believe. They, 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 want, they want all of the details. So there is a self-concept, um, a sort of a centrist <laughs> uh, and apolitical self-concept there that we would all like to think of ourselves, that we're not ideological, that we don't have this blinkered tunnel vision, that we are intellectually curious and that we can consider all possible ideas on the table and consider them and the evidence and, and, and the logic on its own terms and come up with our own decisions, essentially be a free thinker. And, and and not a sheep. Right? This is the self-concept all of us would like to have. Um, and it's very much something that the that the gurus um, flatter, you know, spend a lot of time flattering their audience. Um, now, I, I would guess, I think, that the, the, the presentation of someone like Tim Pool uh, or Dave Rubin, the self-presentation as liberals and to some degree being sort of apolitical. So I, I think their presentation would be that they are uh, very much um, in principle on board with, with all of these very good and nice liberal ideas, but they, but they are fundamentally a free thinker, someone who is based on you know, logic and reason, as they famously say. Um, and so they have that self-image, but they can also dig um, plumb a kind of a, a very powerful well of sort of red meat outrage and emotion laden knee jerk kind of responses, which as we talked about is is the real thing that drives our attention and keeps us coming back. You have to pull on pull on those heartstrings. So it allows you to have those two things at the same time. So um, Timber on Toast is, uh, by the way, an amazing account that's just he's done some a very deep dive on Tim Pool and um, really emphasizes this interesting feature of him, which is this the self-presentation 
Tim Pool presents himself as being sort of both sides and, a, a, you know, in a sort of journalistic dispassion and reason and so on. But um, at the same time, it's, he sort of maintains these sort of two things at once. He, he's doing total, you know, you know, anti-woke, you know, rah, 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 full on right wing stuff. But the audience gets to have their cake and eat it too, right? They, they get the kind of emotional um, um, pull of the very partisan politics and they also get to maintain the self-concept that they're not one of these crazy ideological um you know uh, people they're they're a they're a sort of a scientific thinker so you know i think that's helpful look i'm, I'm trying to think of an example because i want to be fair about this i'm trying to think of an equivalent example on the left and like we said before like it is different the left is just different you can, you can find toxic things going on you could find bad things but they're not the same things as what's happening on the right. So an example of where self-concept might not fit reality on the left is the left has, um, you know, left-wing people often like to think of themselves as, as a, as a movement that is against the, the, the hegemony, right? That, that is, that is, you know, like a workers' parties, we're looking for a revolution, we're supporting marginalized groups and the, the, the powerful groups that run society, we like to think of ourselves as, as sort of in opposition to that, as as the underdog, right? It's it's a very nice narrative, and it's a it's a very nice feeling, and largely true for for most of, um, you know, most of recent history. But I think that's becoming <laughs> progressively less true. Like people, you know, um, you have people like me that are professors at universities, right? You have people that are that are running large corporations, and yeah, like our institutions, um, like you know, the left broadly has control not so much in the united states you have supreme courts and stuff like that that are institutions that are not dominated by the left but you know i don't think the left is necessarily the underdog party to the same extent that it likes to think of itself mm. so yeah just trying to think of examples where the self-concept yeah. we have is not necessarily aligned to to the reality yeah well one where i would say is when you get people who try to think about societal problems through only one lens. So in other words, all problems in society are because of racism or all problems in society are because of, you know, the 1% uh, or the, you know, in pollution or whatever. Like these are, that is a subset of, of left wing guru that does exist, I think. Um, and it's, it's harmful to the left because it does, it prevents the, a larger analysis to show that these issues are often interrelated and caused by, you know, they influence other things. Um, and the reality is that it's not all the one percent. It's not all the, you know, the patriarchy or or the racist or whatever. Like they, these are objectively these problems exist in societies that are, you know, in Africa or in, you know, yeah. where there aren't any white people. <laughs> um, yeah. And so or, or where there where there is a lot more, uh, uh, you know, equality or things like that in terms of in income. Um, yeah. and, and so. So, yeah, those those are things to keep in mind uh, for sure. I think if you're on the political left. Um, so but uh, just uh, as we're wrapping up here, let's maybe have the last question be, um, you know, I, I think one of the, uh, the problems that, you know, we, that we have for the internet is that, you know, and I guess it's, it's endemic to humanity as a whole, but this idea of, you know, understanding how to think about expertise uh because as you know you're talking about it earlier with the the idea of galaxy brain you know a lot of disinformation and misinformation purveyors they'll tell people that well you can decide for yourself i'm just going to show like and again tim pool who you mentioned this uh youtube commenter um he will you know just throw out a bunch of stuff and be like okay yeah well now you decide uh, but the reality is people are, or, and like Dinesh D'Souza, who, who we've been talking about, the, the right wing filmmaker, you know, he just came out with this movie claiming uh, this pervasive, gigantic conspiracy of, of vote fraud in the United States. But he presents no evidence of, of it. He doesn't name a single person in his movie <laughs> who he says did it. 
Like you can't have a conspiracy theory or if, if this is by definition a conspiracy theory, if you have no people you can point to. Uh, mm. Like that's literally what a conspiracy theory is. It's an unprovable broad assertion in which no particular person is responsible. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, but at the same time, you will tell people, well, look, I did this thing, these things here. Uh, you can, you can evaluate the things for yourself. Think for yourself. Uh, yeah. But then, but then it's terrible. Provide any for alternative. <laughs> yeah. It's such a trick, isn't it? I mean, well, this is the thing we've, we've touched on a few times, right? Which is that like any good thing sort of gets weaponized and turned into a bad thing, right? So it's good to have the, you know, to be able to have civil conversations across the aisle, whatever, right? But that also gets turned into what's been called civility porn, right? Um, which is this, this idea of fetishizing that, right? And the most important thing is tone. And then you give yourself a big pat on the back for having a very nice, um, uh, um, friendly chat with someone who's a neo-Nazi, right? And giving them softball um, questions like like Dave Rubin would give to say Candace Owens. Like you don't, that isn't a laudable thing, but it can be twisted so as to be presented as something good. Um, the the sort of stuff that um, the some of our gurus do, you could call it scientism, I guess. Right or cargo cult science, right? Where they they're going through the motions of a rigorous, critical scientific method, but in truth they're doing none of the sort, right? It, it it's a total cosplay exercise. It's all about the show. Um, so, and their when, audience has not in a position to know that though either. Exactly there. So that's where I was getting to, I guess, which is that if you're just a normal person <laughs> and you've got a job and a family and hobbies and a dog and you are not prepared to be um an obsessive and get to the bottom you know in in and and you have the skills to to get to the bottom of any question right whether or not there was vote you know tampering on the election whether or not ivermectin is is uh, an effective treatment unless you have the requisite expertise and uh are not being influenced and not doing motivated reasoning essentially being influenced by your um your um uh, prior assumptions then that is very very hard to do and the people like Dinesh D'Souza or Brett Weinstein who purport or Tim Pool who purport to give you both sides of an issue or give you the sort of evidence or the facts for you to make up your own mind that's very flattering it's very flattering that they are giving you the respect of of bringing you into this conversation and encouraging you. But they, and that would be great if they were doing it in a fair, in a fair and and balanced and accurate way. But the truth is that they aren't. So look, net. I think the moral of the story is that navigating the 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 social media infosphere, um, that this new kind of news and information system that we've created is currently extremely fraught so um the solution is naturally to listen to decoding the gurus and nothing else just just listen to every episode no <laughs> the, the solution is to, you can you can do basically three things as i said at the beginning you can either you know learn some of the red flags like if someone is like self-aggrandizing and making out that they are the expert of everything and uh, uh, the smartest person in the world then you know that's a red flag you know just just make a note of that um, so you can pay attention to these red flags, which is what we try to do with uh, DTG. You can um, try to do your own fact checking, doing your own research, which frankly, for a lot of technical topics is a little bit fraught. Most conspiracy theorists who try to do their own research to get to the bottom of climate change or COVID vaccines or whatever, unfortunately end up diluting themselves more because they have these unacknowledged motivations influencing their research, which which, which guides them along um, the wrong path. So I think perhaps the best thing that one could do is to try to cultivate a healthy trust network, which is what they call about it, right? And and by that, and, you know, be aware of, of um, the kind of mm, the biases and so on in, in whatever circles you're in. Right. You, you could be in academic circles. You could be in left wing activist circles. You could be in this sort of liberal, libertarian, free thinker circles, or you could be in religious Mormon circles or whatever. Just just have an awareness of whatever circle you're in, where the where the bias is going to be and just be particularly on guard for things that are sort of pushing you in that particular direction. 
um, and, and try to get a variety of sources for, for any claims and pay attention to expertise, right? A good example of this is, is COVID, right? Which has been a total disaster in terms of public understanding of science. But one of the things like you could have gotten, like I'm not a virologist, right? I, 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 and I don't need to be. I can easily get the correct, uh, like a, a correct view about vaccines by just noting, well, who is a virologist? Who was working in this field, right? Um, doing you know research on gain of function or whatever, for instance, long before the present brouhaha happened. And who were the people that sort of parachuted into this topic, um, is, um, who have no sort of research background or training? Well, you know that gives you a guide of of who to listen to on a given topic. So that's my advice for people playing at home. Okay. All right. Well, and I guess I would say also to people that you know questioning everything begins with yourself um and questioning your own assumptions and you know if you want to believe something is true the best way to see if it is true is to research it as if it were not true um and then if it is true then you would find out that it is but you know that's it's a much better way of of, of gaining knowledge rather than confirming your own bias. Yeah. So, all right. Well, um, appreciate uh, you joining the show today. Um, we're talking with Matthew Brown. He's the co-host of Decoding the Gurus. And uh, for uh, those who are listening, I'm going to read out the Twitter handle. That's uh, Arthur C. Dent. Um, the, that is, for those who do not get the reference, that is a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, that's what was the 2005 movie now so i think perhaps your reference oh. maybe uh for for some people my, that might be a dated reference <laughs> my ref i have bad news for you the reference is older than that that's uh, from uh, for me anyway the reference is from oh well, the, books the books are older sure the books but, obviously yeah. the books are older in the 70s but also the bbc radio series which was made shortly after the books were published I, when was it late 70s or early 80s um, but that's that's where my character is, um, yeah, is from. Yeah. All right, and then uh, what's your uh, website address if uh, people want to check that out? Oh, um, I don't really know. Um, but if people okay. type in, well, if people I'll, type it, in it, decoding the decoding the gurus, you, you'll find us. Okay. All right. Well, sounds good. I appreciate uh, appreciate you being here today. Thanks so much, Matthew. See ya. All right. See ya. All right. Well, so that's our program for today. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. And um, uh, please do check out uh, theoryofchange.show. And if you liked what you saw here today, please go to patreon.com slash discoverflux. So where you can support us in our work. And um, uh, Flux uh, is uh, the website address for Flux is flux.community. So please do check us out there as well. And uh, we'll see you guys next week with another great show.